So I want to start this way. So uh, I'd like everyone to just take a big deep breath when I count to three. Ready? One, two, three. Now, uh, didn't that feel great? Think about it. So you, you, you know, your lung is probably the most extensible of all organs, and when you did that, you stretched every adherent cell in your lung, the endothelium, epithelium, smooth muscle cells. You stretched them all, but if you went all the way up, you stretched them by about 20% of their length. And just when you're doing just quiet tidal breathing, like you're all doing now, with every breath, you're stretching them by about 4% of their length. And it turns out that those stretches are big enough that they have a dramatic effect on the cytoskeleton. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention this, and I'm not going to go into it much. The cytoskeleton mechanically is actually much closer to being an elastic solid than a viscous fluid. We're going to come back to that. Most biologists think about the inside of the cell as being a chemical liquid factory, but it's, actually it's elastic. Uh, but when you, when you stretch it, it, it goes through a phase change, and it goes from a solid to a liquid and then it slowly re-solidifies. That's called uh, the phenomena of fluidization. So when you <coughs> took that deep breath, you fluidized every adherent cell in your lung, and especially the airway smooth muscle. I'm, I'm actually, my main area is asthma and bronchospasm, and we're interested in those smooth muscle cells because they wrap around the airway, and they constrict like a boa constrictor when they're activated. But in normal people, even if you activate the muscle, when you take a deep breath, you fluidize the muscle, all the contractile force goes away. So. Uh, who cares about deep inspirations anyway? Well, uh, she does. So this is a girl, this is a classic picture of a girl having an asthmatic attack. And she looks like she's going to die because uh, she is going to die unless uh, someone intervenes. And the reason is, now I already mentioned, this is the airway. This is a small airway inside your lung. It's surrounded with alveoli. And that's smooth muscle that wraps around the airway. And in an asthmatic, someone who dies of asthma, instead of looking like this with a nice big tube that you can breathe through, there's uh, more smooth muscle, there's thickening of all these compartments, there's a mucus plug, and you can't breathe through that. That's why asthma is a, a bad disease. And as I already, already told you, with deep breaths, airway smooth muscle fluidizes. And it turns out that it's the, this, just taking a deep breath, it's the most potent bronchodilator we know of. It totally relaxes airway smooth muscle. And you take deep breaths. You don't, you, you've never probably counted, but you take a deep breath about once every six minutes. You don't realize, but you do a sigh. So, and so that's relaxing the airway smooth muscle. Uh, but in asthma, it turns out the mechanism fails. And some people had even thought that this is the proximal cause of why asthmatics get into trouble, because the most potent bronchodilator that we carry around with us all the time doesn't work anymore. Uh, so that was the problem that I'd been working on for the, you know, most of the 1990s and early part of this uh, uh, decade. And it got me interested in, as we started to get more and more reductionist and trying to think about mechanical properties of cells, that's how we started to get into the rheology of cells. So one of the themes that I want to talk about is that the cytoskeleton, not only is it elastic, but it's fragile. When you, it's, it's, it's like... It's made of elastic bonds, but they're all weak. And every time you stretch it, you can just pull the system apart. It's, it's a very fragile system. I'll show you some of the evidence for this in a bit. So just to give you kind of a little bit of an overview of what I'm going to talk about uh, in terms of the mechanics. So uh, we, biologists like to think about the cytoskeleton as a platform for signaling, signaling events, because there's lots of signaling events that go on or are generated by the cytoskeleton, but it's also a physical material. I mean, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. I don't know much about signaling, uh, but I, I know a little bit about mechanics. So this is a, this is a structure. It can deform, it can tr contract, and I'm going to talk about how you image forces in cells. And it also remodels. It's not a static structure, but cytoskeleton is something that's turning over very, very rapidly. The bonds are always turning over. It's a very dynamic system, and it's burning fuel, ATP, all the time. So uh, the big, one of the big questions, and the ones that we focused on a lot, is what are the physical laws that govern the cytoskeleton? If you think about it from the point of view of material science or physics, well, what are the laws? We know about Hooke's laws for elasticity. We know about Newton's laws for viscosity. How do cells behave? Uh, well, uh, first of all, they're fragile. And it turns out this fragility is, it turns out to be universal. Every adherent cell type, and actually most circulating cells, 
uh, have the same kind of generic uh, behaviors, which are very, very strange and don't fit what you read. If you're any of you, any of you material scientists, mechanical engineers, you know, you know, you've all know about viscoelasticity. Uh, forget about it. It really doesn't work in in cells, and I'll show you why. Uh, and and if we can understand these laws, it's important because it'll help us understand how biological systems behave, not just in asthma, but uh, migration, that's what I'm going to talk about a little later, uh, wound healing, barrier function, invasion, uh, epithelial mesenchymal transition, you're going to hear about that tomorrow, development, we just heard about, and uh, actually, if we have a little time at the end, I'm actually going to, I can talk a little bit about evolution, how this fits into an evolutionary perspective. But I'm going to emphasize mechanics, materials, and physics. Not, not signaling. Okay, so, uh, uh, so I've structured uh, this hour in as kind of like a play in four acts. So one is about uh, this fragility, cells as fragile objects, trekking the rugged landscape, that's collective cell migration. Uh, and here I'm gonna talk about, if we get to it, and it's not important that we do, but if there's time, uh, evolution, how, how primitive cells are. We're made out of actually very primitive material and, and the question of the last common ancestor. So does anyone know who this is? Anyone recognize that person? Okay, here's a hint. He was at Harvard Medical School in the first half of the previous century. Okay, not good enough, okay. How about, have any, any of you heard the word homeostasis? Who, ever, who's heard of homeostasis? Okay, uh, this is the guy who coined that word and that idea of homeostasis. That was an idea, it was, it was so important that even people outside of MIT recognized it. That was a joke. <laughs> okay, this guy is a Walter B. Cannon. Uh, and so he's the guy who came up with this idea of homeostasis. It's, it's everywhere in biology in his book, Wisdom of the Body. And he, what he said was this. He said, when a factor is known which can shift a homeostatic state, it is in one direction. It's reasonable to look for factor or factors having an opposing effect. So the whole idea is that in biology, things are regulated. There are positive and negative things that somehow lead to a balance and, and stasis, homeostasis. Okay, so uh, I'm going to use that idea to talk about the fragile objects. So here's a, this happens to be a rat pulmonary vascular endothelial cell. But what I'm going to show you turns out to apply for, to all, all cell types. So it turns, okay, uh, I didn't mean to advance that just yet. So this is sit sitting in a culture dish. And it's not just sitting on the dish. You all know there's adhesion molecules. It's adherent to the dish. And it's not just adherent. It actually, when a cell becomes adherent to a dish, it pulls. It makes contractile forces. So this, this cell is actually pulling on that Petri dish. And it turns out, methods I'm going to tell you about, you can actually image those forces. So this is a tr what's called a traction map. So these forces, as the cell pulls on the substrate, those are called traction forces, and there's a technique called traction microscopy where you can actually measure the distribution of forces that the cell is exerting on the substrate. So you can see there's hot spots here and here tend to be at the cell ends when the cell gets polarized like this. And if you can't make up out the arrows, they're, they're pulling towards the center. So this cell is pulling against its substrate. It's contracting against the substrate. That's a universal property of, or nearly universal property of uh, all cells. So that's true. Uh, every adherent cell is in a state of global tension. And what happens with a mechanical challenge like stretch? So stretch happens all the time. Every time you take a breath, every time your heart beats, a peristalsis in the gut, during development, uh, you see cells were being stretched. Uh, and I know in development of the lung, uh, in the embryo, there's actually waves of peristalsis that go down the airway, which is thought to be crucial for, uh, for development. So, so stretch is, uh, is really, really important. So what happens to these <coughs> forces when you stretch the cell in a physiologic way? So um, there's two ideas in the literature. Okay. One of them is called reinforcement, and that was discovered by Michael Sheets, who you're going to hear from in this course. Right? He's one of the, the leaders, maybe the leader in mechanobiology. Uh, so he, he discovered this phenomenon called reinforcement uh, that was uh, his paper. Many of these are his, not all of them. And uh, the notion of reinforcement is if you, if you attach a microbead to the cell, so you coat it with a ligand, let's say for integrins, and you use 
optical tweezers or laser tweezers or magnetic tweezers, you can, you can pull on the cell, you can tug on the cell. And it turns out the cell, uh, it has passive mechanical properties, but it's also an active system, and the cell responds actively to the force. And when you, when you stretch it locally, it turns out the cell pulls back. So it, it makes an increased local force, it increases its local stiffness, and it actually builds up structure. So if you look here, you'll see more focal adhesion proteins, more actin, because the cell has, has detected that, and it, it responds actively. And uh, in, in Sheets's uh, paper, he talks about this as being a mechanoprotective mechanism. So the cell detects a force, and it reinforces itself, right? That, that's a logical mechanism. So he called it mechanoprotection. Uh, the interesting thing is, it's totally the opposite of uh, what I've been telling you about with fluidization. Uh, these are papers from my lab. We, we found when you stretch a cell, it doesn't stiffen. It, 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 it turns to mush. So which one is it? And when? And ne turn, neither of these is wrong, right? But it's totally a response of the opposite sign. So, so what's going on? So uh, Ramakrishnan had been a fellow in my lab. He's now uh, got his own lab at one of the hospitals across the river. And he, w he was able to develop a technique where he was able to combine traction microscopy with stretch. So you could do both at the same time. It's a very simple technique. I'm not going to describe it, but it's in the literature. It's so easy to do, it's almost embarrassing. That's, that's why it's such a great, a great technique. So here, this happens to be an airway smooth muscle cell, and that's the static traction map. Here's a, a, I think that's phase contrast image of the same cell. And so what he did was he, uh, he put this cell through a, a stretch just like you did earlier. So it's, this is cell strain time, and so here he took a four second stretch of a 10% uniform biaxial stretch. So that's right in the middle of the physiologic range as regards lung. And so the question is, what happens to these contractile forces, right? If, if there's reinforcement, they should get bigger. And if it's fluidization, they should get smaller. Uh, so what happens to the traction response? So here's the movie. Maybe I can, can I do it from here? <clears throat> so what you're gonna see when I run this movie <clears throat> is you're gonna see a few seconds of baseline. You, you won't see what happens during the stretch, but then you'll see what happens after the stretch. And up here, this is a, actually a graph. You, you can integrate these contractile forces and quantify them, and you'll see here what happens to the contractile forces. So here's the movie. His baseline stretch happened right there. As you can see, the, the, the contractile forces just got totally wiped out. I mean, this is a, this is zero to full scale. They went virtually down to zero, at least over the time scale we could. I'll, I'll play that again. Baseline, stretch. So as fast as we can measure, the forces go to zero. Basically, the cytoskeleton got ripped to shreds, and actually, if you look, the actin filaments disappear, actually. We don't understand how that happens, but they disappear, and then they slowly reassemble. I don't know what happened there. <clears throat> and uh, well, the graph is gone. And then over the course of about 600 seconds, you get a recovery, which is about the time between deep inspirations in healthy people. So that's the, uh, that's the fluidization response. Oops, sorry. Well, you're going to see it again. <laughs> And there's the graph showing the recovery over about 600 seconds. Okay, so uh, I'm not gonna show you all the data, but it's a fluidization response. The cytoskeleton went from a solid-like to a fluid-like state, and it turns out this seems to be universal. We've looked at about a dozen or 15 different cell types. It seems to be a universal phenomenon. So coming back to this question, so what's going on here? Well, and why do you get different answers? Well. We don't know, but uh, the specu our speculation is this. In this case, uh, all of these investigators looked at a kind of a local response, pulling on a microbead. And what we had originally been thinking is that if you, and I think what these people were thinking is, if you know what's happening locally, 
then it's easy to predict what's going to happen globally. You just add it all up. For those of you who, you know, if you know the Green's function, if you're into differential equations, you can just add it all up. So that the, uh, the notion is, if you understand that response, where well, you can apply a load everywhere <coughs> homogeneously and simultaneously, and the global response should be the sum of the local responses. That's what we had been thinking. It turns out it's wrong. And it, it turns out even it predicts responses of the wrong sign. It's not a matter of you get you're off by a factor of two. You get the wrong direction of the response. So that makes it interesting. And we speculate. We don't know this for sure, but we have some evidence that suggests it has to do with gradients of strain. When you homogeneously stretch a cell, which pretty much is what you do when you're breathing or your heart's beating, you get one kind of response. But when you have a localized a load, you can get big strain gradients. And that seems to give a response of the other sign. So at least in terms of physiologic types of stretches, we say that fluidization trumps reinforcement. So you, you can ask uh, Sheets if he agrees with this. <laughs> he may or he may not. I'm not sure. So we think that that's the physiologic response. It could be that reinforcement is some kind of an injury response or, or something that, it, in any event, it's a much more local response. So just to summarize what I've told you uh, so far, the cytoskeleton is fragile, and this is, this is a big effect. This is not like you know, a, an adjustment to some kind of uh, other idea. It's, it's a dominant effect. It's not secondary. And in terms of the way biologists tend to think about mechanotransduction, uh, usually we think about either a, a chemical force, that is ligation of, uh, of, of uh, some receptor, or a physical force as representing a first message then it's somehow transduced. Then there's a second message, then there can be a very complicated signaling cascade and an end effect. And a lot of the literature about mechanotransduction thinks about it this way, that <laughs> everything is always mediated by such a, such a pathway, which is, of course, much more complicated than I've sketched it. And actually, here's a, a recent paper looking at, at, at one, of the, one of the important pathways. But in addition, the cytoskeleton's a material and it's a fragile material, and it can be direct effects of physical force on the material that aren't necessarily mediated by signaling. It's just a material that you can pull apart. And, and if you can pull it apart, then it's going to impact all those other steps in the process. And of course, there can be end effects that are mediated by signaling that are going to change the material. So it becomes a really rich and interesting problem to study if you're uh, approaching it from the point of view of physical science. So, is the cytoskeleton fragile or resilient? Um, uh, that's an interesting, it, we, we find it pulls to pieces quickly and easily. Uh, I haven't shown you uh, what happens to the molecular mobility, but it turns out it goes up by two orders of magnitude when you stretch it, that's changing from a solid to a fluid. And the reassembly, I haven't shown you, it's dependent on ATP and certain tyrosine uh, kinases. So, uh, this is another mechanoprotective mechanism, right? So one is to reinforce, right? If you feel the physical force, you reinforce. But another is fluidize, just go with the flow. So that's another way to prevent injury. So it's another mechanism of mechanoprotection. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about material properties of cells. So this happens to be an airway smooth muscle cell. And that, that's not the nucleus. That's a magnetic microbead that we coat with RGD that binds to integrins. And we use that as a mechanical probe. So uh, let me just ask all of you, if you imagine that you can, right, that, I mean, given, given that you're here, you're a very self-selected group, you, you've been thinking about cell mechanical properties at least a little bit. So imagine that you could shrink yourself down to the scale of a cell and you could poke it with your finger. What, what would it feel like? Have you ever thought about that? Anyone have a want to make make a suggestion of what it would if you could, imagine you you shrink yourself down just to poke it, what does it feel like? It should be soft. Soft, good. How soft? Can you think of a material that you'd say was comparable to? <coughs> would it be like a water bed. A water bed. Good, good. You're off by four orders of magnitude, but that's good. That's good. You'll see why in a bit. Anyone else? Mayonnaise. Yeah, well, you've probably heard me talk before. Yeah, it's about like mayonnaise or toothpaste or shaving foam, right? All, you, all, you know, all of you have looked at Gillette Foamy, 
it's, that's roughly how all those things are on the order of one kilopascal Young's modulus. They're really, really soft. And it turns out that's roughly where cells are. And they're roughly of the same consistency, right? Uh, I could take, if I had a bottle of Gillette foam, I could, I could make a big pile of foam. It's actually not going to flow, right? It'll just sit there. It's, a, it's an elastic body. It's a weak elastic body, but it's elastic. If I put a shear force on it, I can fluidize it, but it's actually elastic. That's roughly the mechan mechanical behavior of cells is comparable to Gillette foamy or mayonnaise or uh, toothpaste. So uh, that, that's where we're at. So actually, uh, uh, that's shown here. So here's Young's modulus. That's 11 orders of magnitude. Right? That's how we think about elastic property. A diamond is up here. It's one of the, there are actually things that are stiffer than diamond, but a diamond is usually, in nature, that's the, the stiffest thing you find. Here's all, you know, engineering materials. Uh, here's some biological material. Bone, really stiff, 10 to the 11th pascals. Actin filaments, really stiff, 10 to the 10th pascals. Elastin is like rubber. Uh, here's a foam polymer, waterbed. The foam polymer is about 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 7th, the megapascal. <clears throat> uh, bacteria, if I get it, I probably won't get to the evolution part, but bacteria are here, they're about 10 to the 6. Eukaryotic cells are down here. They're three to four orders of magnitude softer. These things are really, really soft. And they're comparable to foams, paste, colloid suspensions, cold cream is another one, ketchup. Uh, that's where eukaryotic cells are. There's been a lot of work in the biophysics lit lit literature trying to model a uh, cytoskeleton of eukaryotic cells. It turns out actin gels are actually about two orders of magnitude softer. So it's really hard to get an actin gel in the lab that will behave like a cell unless you actually tense it. It turns out tension turns out to be a crucial, a crucial part. You can mimic uh, eukaryotic cells with an actin gel if you shear it or stretch it. Okay, so let me uh, move on. Uh, uh, I, let's see, uh, when, when should I stop talking? I've got uh, okay. Okay. So okay. So let me just. I'll say a few words about this. I wasn't sure if I, should, how much time I should spend. So, so I've already uh, told you that the cells are they're elastic. They're very soft, and it turns out uh, if if you look at this structure, you'd you'd like to be able to predict the stiffness from the constituents, right? And here's the actin filament density, here's the cross-linking density, alpha actin, and so on. And if you try to do that, you actually can't predict the stiffness very well. And the reason is that the stiffness of this system depends on the tension. And you can't really see the tension here. But if you know the tension, you can actually predict the stiffness. And that comes from, from these papers. So tension turns out to be uh, crucial in the whole story. It's just not a matter of passive mechanical properties of, of, of the molecules. Uh, the rheology is weird. Okay, so I said viscoelasticity. I, I, don't, I don't like viscoelasticity. And the reason is this. Uh, when you look in the textbooks about cell mechanics, they'll all say, well, let's postulate some kind of viscoelastic model. And, and some of you know, know what those are. It turns out all those models have built into them certain time scales or viscoelastic time constants. It turns out when you actually measure the mechanics of this system and you do it over a very wide range of frequencies, like four or five or six orders of magnitude, you can't find any time constants. What you find is that the elastic modulus goes like omega's frequency. It goes like frequency to some power. It's a power law. And alpha is typically about 0 0.2, 0 0.1 or 0.2. So it's a weak power law. And just if you make a graph, you just see stiffness progress progressively increases as you go decade after decade of, after decade of frequency, the stiffness just keeps going up as a straight line on log log paper. So you can say, well, okay, I can model that with an infinite distribution of time constants, but it turns out that that's not a satisfying, uh, yeah, you can model the data, but it's not mechanistic. And the interesting thing is things like pastes and, and, and foams and slurries, physicists, Soft matter physicists call those soft glasses, and the rheology of those things just is not, still is not understood. It's not understood, and work from my lab, actually, these papers show that cells belong to that class of soft glassy materials. And th th this is one of the features of power law rheology that really you can't represent 
uh, at least mechanistically, in terms of uh, uh, viscoelastic models, because the stresses really, the viscous stress, the frictional stresses are not viscous. I'll get to that in a second. Also, it turns out the mechanics depend on the rate of ATP utilization, especially, especially the loss, the friction depends on the rate of ATP utilization. So it's, it's different than other, uh, it's even, even other soft glasses in that regard. So at the molecular level on the side of skin, frictional stress is not a viscous stress. So those of you who know about viscosity, the idea is you shear a fluid and there's momentum exchange as molecules go back and forth from higher to lower velo velocities. That's probably not what's going on in the cell. It's probably more like there are bonds that hold it together. And when you stretch the system, the bonds store elastic energy. And then when the bonds break, that energy gets dissipated, like Velcro. Right? Right? You could peel Velcro, and it's going to absorb a lot of energy. But it's not viscous. It's more you're pulling, stretching those springs, and then they go boing, and the energy's gone. So it's, it's not a vis viscous mechanism. It's more like breaking of bonds that then reassemble in a manner that's dependent on ATP. I've already told, told you about uh, fluidization. You can look at the, at the nanoscale of motions in this system, uh, and it's really interesting. Uh, I think you, meant, you mentioned something about uh, thermal agitation. Right? So there is thermal agitation here, which is making uh, molecules move. But it turns out much bigger than that are the motions that are driven by ATP hydrolysis, because ATP releases about 20 kT. So kT is thermal agitation. Hydrolysis of ATP is 20 kT. And it turns out if you look at the motions here, the, the, the Stokes-Einstein relation. Any of you know what Stokes-Einstein is? Some of you. OK, so Einstein in 1905 uh, said that basically viscosity and diffusion are the same, the same process. You, if you know diffusion, you can predict viscosity and vice versa, because it has to do with molecular collisions and thermal agitation. Well, it turns out it doesn't work in cells. It doesn't even come close. So that, that breaks down. And, and the motions that you find are, are molecules are, get caged, and then they hop. They get caged and hop. And so it, the rheology is just <coughs> it doesn't fit. By the way, a viscoelasticity would say that Stokes-Einstein has to hold. Uh, collective cell migration I'm going to talk about in a second. And uh, I'll, let me not, not say anything about that. So uh, just to recap, we can think about cytoskeleton as a spatial template for mechanotransduction downstream signaling, or we can think about it as a material for stress, stress transmission that can contract to form and remodel. So this is just to say, this is a, uh, an important paper by Chan and Odie that appeared a few years ago where they looked at how cells uh, spread and move. And the notion is that there are bonds that form and break at the leading edge that, that are related to fragility, so they related to motility. So the system has these on and off uh, springs that can dissipate <coughs> energy. This is a, a, a different model. This is called the glassy worm-like chain, but it has some of the same features. It says that actin filaments can get stuck on one another. And it turns out this model actually maybe is the best one for understanding cytoskeleton. It's, uh, it's a very nice model. All, what these have in common is that they say the system is weak, it's flimsy, it's fragile, you can pull it apart, it fluidizes, and in this case, you can say that these bonds act like some kind of a clutch that you can uh, pull apart. This is the traditional viscoelastic picture, by contrast. Uh, uh, this is from a paper by Bausch uh, over 10 years ago, which had been the classic of cell mechanics. This had been the paradigm. Uh, or uh, some of you know about the tensegrity model from Ingber. Uh, well, if you listen to Ingber talk about this, he emphasizes that this structure is stable, robust, resilient. Well, it is. That is. But I think cells probably be. Th th this captures some features of cells, but certainly not all of them. OK. So let me move on to collective cell migration. So. This is a monolayer of MDCK cells, uh, MED and Darby canine uh, kidney cells. And let me just play the movie. It's, it's a lot like the one you already saw, but a little different. So this is like a wound healing assay. So there's no cells here. Here are these cells, and they're, they're moving to fill the wound. Okay. Uh, things like this have been measured for a long time. Sorry. <clears throat> Let that play. Okay. Oops. Okay. 
So those are cell motions. Uh, the earliest paper I know of is 1914, where motions like these were analyzed. The question is, and the question that my lab became interested in is, what, what are the physical forces that are associated with these kinds of motions? Can you, can you relate the forces to the motions? It's actually not obvious that you can when you think about it. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll get into, into this in a second. And when you look at this, it looks like the cells are flowing. Right? And, it's, and in some sense, they are flowing. But are, are they behaving like a liquid? Or are they actually uh, more like uh, uh, solid-like? Actually, I'm going to show you they're actually, even though they're flowing, they're solid-like. Uh, so how can you understand this problem of collective cell migration? And actually, let me interrupt myself by saying the problem of single cell migration has been a big problem in the last 20 to 30 years. And it's now pretty much worked out. The, the, the problem of how a single cell in isolation crawls now there are really good models uh, for that. Collective cell migration is a totally different story. We don't understand it. So uh, how do you understand these kinds of motions? Well, it depends on what literature you read. So uh, one, one area of the literature, <coughs> it says that it's all about leader cells, that there are specialized cells at the leading edge. They've been studied a lot, especially recently. You can see this one, this one, this one. And the notion is that these are cells that are specialized for pulling. They're like, they're like uh, the locomotive of a train. And they're, they're pulling the sheet. So th these are the ones that are pulling. And they're pulling the sheet to the left. So if the, the model would be, imagine you're in bed and you grab the edge of the blanket, right? And you, you pull it up under your chin. So all the motive force is at the edge. And you pull, the, you pull the sheet along. So the implication there is if it's all about these leader cells, that means the cells behind must be in tension, OK? So uh, that's the model that really dominates injury and, and wound healing literature. OK. Uh, here's another idea, and that's that each individual cell is mechanically self-propelled. Right? Each, each cell has its own uh, mode of force, potentially. And uh, this would be uh, like soldiers marching in a column. Right? All the soldiers are marching along together, but there's no, no force of interaction between them. Each one is self-propelled, or cars in traffic. So in that case, the stress in the layer would be close to zero. Um, so there's, there's a whole literature on this kind of either modeling cells as being uh, diffusive motions or fancier models, levy flights, things of that sort. Uh, in the cancer and development literature, you, you find more about the notion that this proliferation behind the leading edge and the, that proliferation actually pushes the front forward. It expands the colony and pushes the front forward. So the notion there is that actually the cells here would be in compression because you get more and more of them with time and it pushes the front forward. So actually, I'm just curious. How, how many think it's, it's this one? Just good, OK. And, and, and this one? Nobody. This one? OK. And so the, the rest of you don't think anything, right? But should they be like exclusive? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Uh, and it could be in different, it could be one in one kind of system and one in another, <coughs> could be. I, like, for example, in tumors, I mean, people have measured pressure in tumors and it, it's compressive. But in a monolayer like this, even there, you know, pe people argue about it. And the problem is that there was no, there had been no way to actually measure the stresses in the monolayer. How do you measure the stresses? So it's been, you know, people have looked at things like look at stress fibers and it, it, the cell looks like it's being pulled this way or pushed that way. But it would be really nice if you could actually measure the stresses. Well, uh, they had been inaccessible until recently. But it turns out uh, you, can, you can, now there are techniques to, to make the forces visible. So let me, let me show you some of them. So here's this same monolayer. And it's just a home, all MDCK cells, uh, nothing fancy about it. Uh, so first, it turns out this guy, Javi Tripot, had been a fellow in my lab. He's now a professor in Barcelona. He took the, this traction microscopy that I already showed you, one traction map for a single cell. He and Jim Butler figured out how to do the same kind of thing for a whole monolayer. And it turns out it required some doing. But now it's done, so you, you, no one has to redo it. The math is done. It, it turns out to be not easy, but they did it. And they measured the traction forces that the cells are exerting on the substrate. Okay, So when you look at that, this is the picture. 
that you see. So let me orient you. So again, these are the forces or the, the shear stresses that the cells are exerting on their substrate. <coughs> the warm colors are cells that are pulling themselves to the left. Okay, and the blue here is actually cells that are pulling the other way. And when we first saw this, we were very, very surprised uh, for a couple of reasons. One is it's, so, it's heterogeneous, right? It, you know, it's punctate. It's, you know, it's not a smooth picture. We thought whatever we'd see, it would be smooth. It turns out it's not smooth. Cells that are near by each other pulling in different directions. Uh, you can see it's mostly red at the leading edge. So th th those, are, those are the leader cells. And they are uniformly pulling t to the left. But it turns out when you add up the forces, it turns out there's a net, uh, in general, cells are pulling uh, to the left. And these actually add up to much more than what's happening at the front edge. You can actually play in the movie. So not only is it heterogeneous, here's the movie. Uh, the, the stresses flicker on and off. So it's not like one cell is always pulling in the same direction. It'll be pulling in one direction at one time and another direction at another time. So it's, it's not the position in the gel or the particular cell. It's, that it's something that's dominated by fluctuations, which is uh, really interesting. Oops. What is the resolution of your force measurement? It's about what you can see here, which is a pixel. So it's about you know, five microns, something like that. A few pixels per cell, right? Uh, no. One pixel per cell, you said? No. No, so here, these are individual cells, which maybe are 10 pixels across, something like that. And I, these are like, I can't remember how big the pixel size is. So what's the like, distance from the leading edge to your cell? Uh, this is, oh, I don't, I don't remember. I think 100, I, I, I lost the scale bar, which used to be here. Maybe that, that's 100 microns, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how would the stress distribution uh, change if you um, if you begin imaging right from the start where you have a free edge? So right I'm going to show you that. That's a wonderful question. It's a paper actually. Roger might have sent it to you. I hope the paper just appeared on Sunday that answers that question. I'm going to try to get to it. That, posted, you sent it to me. Oh, okay. It's posted. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but that's a wonderful question, and uh, and I'll, I'll show you the answer. In a, in a bit. There we go. Uh, we can look at the same data a different way. So he, here's a piece of bare gel, and we can look at the traction force at that point as the cell monolayer sweeps over it. So here, here's traction. That's the noise floor. And here come the cells. I, I, every time I see this slide, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed. Uh, so what you see is there's nothing, and then actually the first lamellipodium, there's actually a little bit of pushing, but then it's, it's these huge fluctuations. And what we had thought, we, we thought we were going to see some smooth kind of signal with maybe little fluctuations, but it's not. It's huge fluctuations with a small baseline. So there's a net tension. The monolayer is basically in tension, but that mean value is swamped by the fluctuations. So it's a very heterogeneous system. So if one is interested in mechanotransduction and how certain kind of binding or signaling is force dependent, the idea that you're just going to use some kind of an, you know, a mean field theory, average it all out, that it's smooth, it probably is, is way, way off. It's very interesting. So is there any characteristic time scale of the oscillation, or is it like power law distribution? Uh, that, uh, yes, there is, and it has to do, we've got another paper I'm not going to talk about. It, we have reason to think that these cells are close to what's called a jamming transition, like coffee beans that get jammed in a chute. And it turns out as the cell density goes, I'm not going to show the data, but as cell density goes up, the fluctuations get spatially bigger and slower. And, and, and you can get usually packs of cells from 5 to 30 packs all moving together. That depends on a number of things, including cell density. So it, it's, it depends, and you, and you need a different kind of frame to, to think about it. And we think jamming or 
traffic is is something that's related to that, but I'm not going to talk about it. But it, we we published a couple of papers on that. Okay. Oops. Sorry. Okay. So uh, so it's all about the fluctuations and they're severe. And it turns out most of the action is far behind the leader. It's it's not about the leader cells. So I think it, leader cells. Okay, that's another paradigm that uh, or dogma that we you know. Leader cells are interesting, and they, they maybe give guidance, uh, and, but in terms of pulling the monolayer forward, uh, they don't actually do much. Now, this is interesting. So here's that circle and that one of the same. So that's a pack of about two or three cells, four cells maybe. And these guys, they're moving to the left, but in terms of the forces they're exerting on the substrate, it's as if they're pulling in the other way. So either they're, they're trying to go against the stream or maybe they're being dragged along and they're dragging their feet. So, so what's going on here? And why are they moving the way they're moving? Well, in terms of people who study cell motility, uh, the mechanisms that are known are kind of chemotaxis, so cells want to move along some chemical gradient. Uh, durotaxis, cells can feel differences in elastic properties of the substrate and usually want to go from softer to stiffer. Uh, haptotaxis is there can be differences of adhesion and cells might want to go up an adhesion gradient. Well, it turns out none of those apply in this model system. So something else is going on here. Somehow cells are swept along by the crowd. And I'm going to get into this. this it's called, plith now we call it plithotaxis. So now to understand that, uh, you have to understand that th this is only part of the mechanical problem. All right, so these are the forces that the cells exert on the substrate. But what about the forces they exert on each other, right? That's a, that's a different matter. So uh, this is where uh, Donna J. Tambe and Corey Harden in my lab uh, actually figured out a way to, to compute those. So here's the physical picture. Here's a monolayer. And these red arrows represent the traction <coughs> forces here. So that's, those are the forces that the cells are exerting on the substrate. And uh, it turns out it can be like a tug of war, right? So here these men are pulling on a rope. And it turns out, if you know the traction forces, it's really easy to figure out the tension in the rope. Right? The tension in the rope is zero here. It's one unit here, two units here, three units here. Because Newton's law says you have to have a force equilibrium. Right? That, that's, is that clear to everybody? Obvious? So what that means is, if you know the traction forces, you can actually then compute the intracellular forces, the forces that one cell exerts on, its, on the other. It's, it's almost as simple as that. So here you can put that in terms of uh, mathematics. So here's, here's the monolayer. Here's how we actually do the experiment. There are fluorescent microbeads here in the, in the gel. This is a soft gel. It's about one kilopascal. You can measure the deformation of these, of these uh, particles, and that, that gives you the traction force. That was something that was worked out by Treepot and Butler. Uh, we put other beads here to correct for stage drift. And then if you know the tractions, you can just add up the forces because the force balance is the stress here minus the stress here has to be the traction force. So from the measured bead displacements, you can compute analytically the traction force. And you, you can, you can uh, do that pretty rigorously. And then once you know the traction forces, you can, this is just Newton's law. The, the divergence of the stress has to be the applied force. And you, so you can get this internal stress field. And it turns out it's almost model free. So you know, say, so do you need a model to do this? Well, <coughs> sort of, but the assumptions are really weak and uh, uh, not really a problem. So w one last thing before I show you the result. So if you can then compute the state of stress everywhere inside the monolayer, so this is the typical engineering way of representing stresses. So that's the sigma on the x face in the x direction, on the y face in the y direction, shear stress on the y face in the x direction, shear stress on the x face in the y direction. So you all m maybe know, or if you don't, you do now, that you can, you can rotate your laboratory frame. And you can, if you find just the right orientation, these stresses can always be converted into these. This is called the maximum principal stress the minimum principal stress, and the principal orientations, like this. And the nice thing about this description is when you find this 
this orientation, shear stresses are zero. So the zero shear stress on those faces. So this state of stress and that state of stress are exactly the same. It's just a mathematical trick. It comes from Moore's Law, for those of you who know what, what that is. So this is totally equivalent. So that's nice. So you can find orientations where the shear stress is zero, faces where the shear stress is zero. So um, let's look at the model there. So here's, now I'm switching. This happens to be endothelial cells, but everything I'm going to say applies to epithelial cells as well. What happens if you look at the tensile stress? This is now the cell-cell forces. Again, we, we got a, a bit of a surprise. So this is a kind of a relief map showing, if you will, cytoskeletal tension or, or tension between cells at cell-cell junctions. Uh, so uh, th this is zero up to 300. And what you find is you find these kind of massive peaks. So that peak there comes from a cluster of about 50 cells here. And here's another kind of mountain range here, which is, corresponds to those. And th these are a bunch of cells that are working cooperatively to build up tension, passing it from cell to cell. So it's, you get a rugged stress, stress landscape. Uh, so this is rugged. And so as the cells migrate, they're, they're maneuvering in a stress landscape that's very, very rugged. They're, they're also creating that landscape because of this cooperative stress pileup, this notion that one cell pulls on its neighbor, pulls on its neighbor, pulls on its neighbor to make structures like those. So there's a tension pileup, and uh, the stress landscape is severe. So, uh, so this is just tension. So this is kind of averaging over all directions. So some of you more mechanical guys might ask, is the stress isotropic? And it turns out it's not. So here, here th th this, is, this is actually, it's complicated but interesting. So. Each one of these ellipses, take that one, represents the state of stress at that point. And this is the, that's the principal orientation, the maximum principal orientation this way, the minimum principal orientation is that way. So you can see the stress is not isotropic, right? It's, the tension is higher going this way than that way. And uh, you can see that there's correlation, that these ellipses tend to be organized in swirling patterns that are coherent over many, many cell bodies, over like 50 cell bodies, something like that. So you see this swirling. So, so, so the stresses are distributed in this interesting heterogeneous pattern, but there's lots of correlation across cells. It's not totally random. So that's the stress landscape. Now what I haven't told you yet is what the, re the red arrows are. The red arrows are the instantaneous velocity of the cells, the migration velocity. And when you just look at this, what your eye seems to tell you is that the cellular velocities tend to be aligned with the maximum principal orientation, so like this and like this. And it turns out that that's exactly right. And I, I, I think I might have some data I'm going to show you. So it turns out, and, and this is, I think, an important discovery, that cells tend to move along the direction of maximum principal orientation. And that's something we, we hadn't known before. And there's another int very interesting implication that isn't worked out yet. So here's a cell, and here let's, let's look at that cell-cell junction, and here's the state of stress at that cell-cell junction. There's normal stresses, tensile stresses, and a shear stress. Well, it, this says that cells are moving along the maximum principal orientation. And I told you, based on Moore's law before, that along that orientation, the shear stress is zero. So what this is saying is that cells are tend to move. They're happy to push and pull on their neighbors, but they can't support any shear stress. So uh, that's actually uh, very interesting. So along the principal orientation, the shear <coughs> stress is zero. So cells tend to trek along shear-free trajectories. So these motions, the cells are minimizing the shear stress between them and their neighbors. They're happy to push or pull. But in terms of shear, they can't support or don't support shear stress. So this phenomenon, it's not chemotaxis, it's not haptotaxis, it's not durotaxis. Instead, it's some innately cooperative and collective behavior. So we gave it a name. We call it plithotaxis. So uh, from the Greek word plithos, from a crowd, swarm, or throng. And the principle is that neighboring cells join forces to transmit normal stresses across cell-cell junctions, normal meaning perpendicular, 
but they migrate along orientations of minimal intracellular shear stress. So what that says is either the adhesion molecules here, let's say um, either tight junctions or adherence junctions, well, there'd be no tight junctions, or a few tight junctions here, because this is endothelial. <coughs> but it's, it, it's saying that um, those, those uh, cell cell adhesion molecules, either they're not able to support shear stress, or somehow they remodel so that they don't support shear stress. And we don't know which one it is. So, um, and we know that this is true of epithelial and endothelial uh, monolayers and uh, even uh, breast cancer cell lines before the EMT but not after the EMT. So that's, uh, that's plithotaxis. Uh, let me just move on. So this is just a blow up of that same picture. Uh, this, let me just skip, th this is actually the doc, I'm, I'm gonna skip this. This is just showing that the cell motion is highly correlated <laughs> with the maximum principal orientation. So that's the statist statistical support for Jeff, what? when you say maximum principal orientation, you mean the actual orientation, not the maximum principal stresses? I mean the orientation, so, so in, in the stress field, there's a maximum and a minimum stress. principal stress orientation. Okay. Yeah, so stress. Not, not, not the elongation of the cell. No, no, no. 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 Okay. It turns out in cells that are elongated, they also tend to elongate along the maximum principal stress orientation. That's for endothelial cells. Epithelial cells are more like fried eggs and don't have preferred orientation. Yet, even though the cells aren't oriented, the motions and the stresses are oriented. Okay. Excuse me. So, uh, in order to determine the principal directions, you have to know the shear stresses. I'm sorry, could you say that so again? To know the uh, principal directions, first you have to measure the uh, shear stress. Yes, that, that's right. So that's, that's we the, measure, yeah, actually what, from that, I went over it fast, but from the force balance in the monolayer, we, we can get all the stresses inside the monolayer, the normal stresses and the shear stress. I didn't show you the maps mm -hmm. in the interest of time, but yeah, we, we, we have, th those, those numbers are there and they can be pulled out and mapped. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I noticed in some cases, the, I mean, in most cases, they, they line up in the direction of motion. Uh, not always. Yeah, but in some cases. Yeah, actually, uh, let me go back. <coughs> That's uh, good. Yeah, so, uh, so it's a st statistical thing. So here, you get very good alignment, yet let's say here it's not so good, here it's not so good. So it turns out that where the stresses are the most anisotropic, that is when, when these ellipses are more like spindles, that's when you get the strongest relationship. When there's no preferred orientation, is that, was there any of these like circles? Oh, maybe that one, this one. So if there's no preferred orientation of the stress, you, you can't find a correlation between the motion and the, and, and, and the, and the principal orientation. If you look at the bottom line. Here? Which? Uh, yeah. tell, tell me. Yeah. Uh, the here? Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Well. Yeah. It's it's bad. Oh, here? Yeah. 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 The it, the correlation is bad. So it's it's a tendency. It's a tendency. Yeah. Almost all. You can find. Uh, if I go back, you can find pockets of compression. They tend to be small. And few. Mostly, it's overwhelm overwhelmingly tensile. Overwhelmingly tensile, although you can find regions of compression. Yeah? I got the point that the uh, motion is in the direction of the uh, maximum stress, but uh, I'm having a hard time to connect this to the collaborative behavior. To the collective behavior. Good. Well, me too. <laughs> how do you re reason that this is due to... Uh, well, I mean... I mean, this, the stress field itself is somehow cooperative, right? Because this, this correlation that you see, and we've quantified in, in other papers, the, the cells are not behaving independently. They're, it's, it's, it seems to be all about the cooperativity and how one is pulling on its neighbors. So it's some kind of a cooperative phenomenon. And similarly, the velocities are hardly correlated. And he, here's actually a deep question that I don't know how to think about. We, you'd like to think that the forces steer the motions, right? That's, as engineers, we like to think about 
That way the forces steer the motions. But is that what really what's happening? Maybe. Another could be cells just decide, where I'm going this way. And it could be the stresses are just a byproduct of the motion, right? Because these, they're mechanical objects. They have certain elastic properties. And they go where they go, and there's going to be a, a, a it's going to cause stresses. So what's, put it another way, what's the cause and what's the effect? And actually, we don't know. We don't know. So does the idea F equals MA apply here? I'm sorry. I, so the idea of F <coughs> equals MA apply here? Uh, not, well, okay. There, the, the inertial, no. In, in, the, yes, yes and no. The notion that there's a force balance and that maybe there's an equation of motion, like, right, if we were fluid mechanics guys, like me and Roger are, you'd say, well, if this was a fluid, we'd say it's Navier-Stokes, which is just a force balance of, of each little element here. I said no because inertia is, there's no M in this problem. And the accelerations are small, so there's no inertial effects, but there's, there's a, a elastic stresses, there are frictional stresses, and there are contractile stresses. And in each element, each small element, th those forces have to be in balance. And if you could discover the law that relates the forces to the motions, <coughs> you have a science paper. Right? And we don't, if we, if we're actually, Jay Kim is back there in my lab. That's what he's trying to do. Is, you know, what's, what is the relationship of forces to motion? Is, or even, is there a relationship? It's not clear that there is. It's really not clear that, th that there is. I mean, in fluids there is. In elastic bodies there is. In cells, it's, not, it's actually not clear. There's an old saying in physics that it's hard to find a black cat in a dark room. Think about that. Hard to, especially if there is no black cat. That's also, it's not exactly a joke, but it's supposed to be funny. Yeah. First, and then the stresses um, conform. Yeah. It might be that the ones that don't line up, maybe the cell has just turned the direction its brain or mathematician's brain. Uh huh. And then it's, it's about to do its um, physical change, and but you've just taken the shot before it's made the change, and so that's why they're not out. We thought about that. Uh, not, uh, I'm not, I don't think I understand. I, I don't understand what you said. So could you, you say, it, could you say it again? I didn't follow. So if, if the cell chooses its direction that it wants to go in, yeah, and then it makes its body shape changes, yeah, yeah, um, and so then its stress um, certain changes, mm -hmm. um, so it can move. What if um, there's it has to be a delay between the cell deciding to go one way and making the change? So what if you take the photo? Ah, uh, good. I think, hold that question, because I think it's related to the question that, what's your name? You, you asked me about the... Manchu. Yeah, yeah Manchu. I'm going to, I'm going to show some data that may bear on that. What happened? Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay. So let's, uh, let's move on. And I, I hope I'll get to something that will help to answer this. OK. A few, am I still, I'm still OK on time? Well, we, we would be entering into a half hour discussion. Now. So, but but let there me, is discussion, so I'm, I'm happy for maybe, you. Uh, let me, I'll, maybe I'll finish up in five. I'll, I'll, try to, I'll just go quickly over this next. I promised this other stuff. So let me just go quickly over this, jump, and then I'll wrap up. OK. So. Uh, 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 traction force microscopy. So actually the first paper, really important, uh, Cyril Harris, 1980 in Science, he put cells on silica silicon uh, uh, membranes and he showed that the cells can wrinkle the membrane. So that was the first demonstration that cells generate contractile force. Uh, then, I'm sorry, I went ahead of myself, then uh, Micah Dembo over just across the river at Boston University was the first to show that you can actually quantify that and make these traction maps. And it was actually Jim Butler in my group who actually showed that you can um, tremendously simplify the problem. 
and you can also democratize it. That is to say, uh, Dem Dembo didn't share his software, and no one could duplicate it because it was too complicated. But Butler showed you could do the problem much more simply, and he, he gave the software away to everybody. So that, that most people use Butler's technique now. Uh, Ramakrishnan, I, I talked to you about, he showed how you can use the same technique with fluidization and for studying cell polarization. Then in terms of collective cell migration, I've already told you about that. Uh, and uh, plethotaxis, but now in the last few minutes, let me just talk about, about the question that this young man asked, which is what happens when you lift a barrier and, and uh, let cells go off to the races? So this is a paper, it just appeared Sunday. So uh, what, this is a group, the, the experiments were actually done in Barcelona by uh, Javi Tripat <coughs> and, and his students. So here was the idea, they, put, they, they made a, a polyacrylamide gel and they put a, a, a PDMS membrane on top of it, and they plated cells in this rectangular region. Uh, they, they grew the cells to confluence, and then they lifted off the, uh, the membrane and let, let that rectangle of cells start to expand. Okay, so here's what they found. So here, T equals zero, and, and this is uh, uh, stably expressed uh, GFP actin. So here's the monolayer. So there's no cells here, cells here that have been grown to confluence. And then an hour later, the cells have started to flatten and crawl. And then four hours later, they've crawled and flattened quite a bit. Okay. So here's what they find for actin. It turns out the actin cytoskeleton of these cells, you can't really see it here but you get much more, a lot of transverse stress fibers here that you didn't see here. This is e cadhedron so these are cell-cell junctions. And inter this is really interesting. You see lots of e cadhedron here, but as the cells start to spread, and I'm gonna show you that the, the, the tensile forces are going up, way up here compared to here, the e cadhedron goes away. This is really, really interesting because there's a number of papers in the recent literature looking at cell-cell pairs, just two cells, and measuring the force at the cell-cell junction and showing that e-cadhedron lo localization goes up with increasing force. But in this system, it goes down with increasing force. So, uh, so it looks like cell packs are not the same as just two cells uh, kissing one another. Uh, th this is tight junction proteins, they don't change. This is paxillin, so that's a component of focal adhesion complexes at the cell base they go up. Okay, so it, it looks like it's a transition from an epithelial kind of towards a mesenchymal state, but it's not complete because e cadhedron <laughs> gets partially internalized. It, it's not increasing with increasing stress, it's going down. And also there's, uh, there's been actually in, in your field, in, in developmental biology, Thomas LeCute has been saying that the, f the flow that you find in developmental biology may be going up a cadhedron gradient which would make some sense, actually. Uh, but actually, it doesn't. Actually, it's going in the opposite. Cells are going down the cadhedron gradient here. So what's going on is actually not at all clear in terms of that. So here's, uh, I didn't download the movies, but this is kind of stop frame. So here's at, at 15 minutes, 120 minutes, 450 minutes showing this strip of cells spreading. Here are the velocities the cellular velocity. So initially, you see that the cells on the right start moving to the right. It's color-coded here. Cells on the left start going to the left, but nothing much happens in the center. The motions start to kind of penetrate from the edges in until you get uh, much later this pattern where cells on the right are mostly going to the right and cells on the left mostly to the left. Here's the traction forces. So these are the forces that the cells are exerting on the substrate. Before you lift the membrane, there's actually almost nothing. As soon as you lift it, you start getting traction forces that appear at the boundaries, like at a boundary layer. So these are pulling to the left, these are pulling to the right, and then with increasing time, they develop more and start, to, again, there's nothing much in the center, but much later, you see here, cells on the right are mostly pulling to the right, but not totally. Cells on the left, are red, they're mostly pulling to the left, but there's still plenty of blue. So again, this heterogeneous picture. And then you can 
you can then actually compute the intercellular stresses. This is, I, I can't remember which component this is. This is average normal stress. This is just cytoskeletal tension. Initially, it's really small. It builds up at the edges and then penetrates and then penetrates in. So uh, here's, this is now the, in, the interesting thing. You can take these data and you can simplify them using something called a chymograph. Anybody, any of you ever heard of chymographs before? Some of you, okay. So here's what a chymograph is. So here are these data. The problem is it's two-dimensional in space and one-dimensional in time, right? There's X and Y and there's T, but we can reduce the spatial dimensions. I could just take this and average it over Y and just look at the average value of the velocity as a function of X. So for example, at this time, at 120 minutes, if I average these, I can then make a chymograph. This is now time versus distance, <coughs> and this is showing color-coded the velocity distribution at that time here. So that's the color coding here. I could do the same thing for this time, for this one, that's here, and for this one, that's here. So that's the chymograph. And so with this, this slope, this is time versus distance, that's the speed, that slope is the speed of the advancing front. Same thing here. And what you can see is basically when you lift the membrane and you start the race, nothing happens in the center. And then there's some kind of a, looks like a wave that penetrates all the way through. And then you get all kinds of interesting phenomenon here. And actually here, here you get cells all moving to the right, cells all moving to the left, but here's the reverse. These are cells, there's a pocket of cells here moving to the right, those are moving to the left. And down the center line, you actually get pulsations. So let me just show you those. So here's, that's the same velocity chymograph. This is the traction force chymograph showing that the, all the traction forces are very heavily concentrated at the, at the edge, although there's, there is stuff in the middle. And this is the tension chymograph. Again, very little tension at the beginning and then it builds up high tension in the center here, given, given enough time. Here, th this was the most exciting uh, slide. We looked at the strain rate, so the, the rate at which cells were expanding, and what happens is you find that there's a wave that's generated when you, when you lift, when you lift the uh, barrier, a wave gets generated here that propagates across the whole monolayer. So that's a strain rate a wave that goes over there and it bounces off, and similarly one that starts here and goes here. And this, this wave has roughly twice the velocity of the leading front. So this is a, a mechanism of communication from one edge of the monolayer to the other. Uh, and we don't really understand, we have some ideas of what this is. We even have a model in the paper, but I'm not sure that we, we believe it. So this is a very interesting wave of rarefaction that starts at the leading edge and, and penetrates the whole uh, monolayer. So they make an X on a chymograph, so we call them X waves but we don't really know what they, what they are. So again, just to look at these, so here, when you just lift the barrier here, that corresponds to this point. So at that point, uh, the cells are neither moving nor straining. At this point, the wave has penetrated some, but not up to that point. So the cells are not moving or straining. But here, at that point, the cells are pretty much moving on block and they're consolidating. So that's what these interesting. I'm going to, st I'll stop with this, with this last graph. Uh, if you just look in the center here and focus on these cells, uh, the color code here is the average, uh, the stress in the x direction, so that's the tension along this direction. You can measure that tension and you can also measure cell size here. So if you measure cell area, in here, it turns out it's oscillating. It goes up and down and up and down. And you can also measure the stress. And the stress goes up and down and up and down. And they, they, they seem to be actually in phase. So since the stress and the area are in phase, that means it's an elastic stress. It's not a viscous stress. So there's all kinds of interesting phenomenon here relating forces and velocities and so on. And if someone knows how to figure this out, uh, we'll have a, a big step forward. The, the important thing is now we can measure the forces. 
they're, they're not a matter of speculation anymore. You can measure them and, and try to drill down a little bit deeper. So I don't know if this answers your question, but they're, they're, let, me, let me just stop there. <coughs> Of, of motion regulating cel yeah. cellular processes? Utilizing the motion to regulate. Uh, uh, I don't know. You know there's, there's a lot about stress or, or stretch, but about motion per se. Certainly wound healing is motion, and that's what people in the wound healing literature measure. And even in development, there's a lot of me measurement of motion. But I don't know, the answer to your question, I don't know. It may be known, but it's not known by me. Uh, it's a good question. Yeah? Was there any cell proliferation during the Oh, good, yeah. It turns out um, there's a lot, and about roughly half of the area expansion is due to proliferation in this case, about half. So there is proliferation, but even though there is, the stresses are mostly tensile, or they're almost all tensile. So you, you can't ignore the proliferation. It's before there. Before you remove the barrier, the cells are probably contact inhibited. Uh, yeah, that's right. Actually, we, we have data about that. And so the, the, the proliferation has gone down. And as you <coughs> release it, then the proliferation, the cell numbers start to go up. Yes? Um, so the last few slides were on that relatively new study. But um, I was wondering the method of how the membrane was removed could affect how the uh, cells begin to move. Yeah. That's good. That's a good question. Actually, I don't know the answer to that. There's, there are some other papers in the literature on wound healing who have asked just that question because they say, is it, is it the injury when you, if you, if you actually, like scratch wound healing assays, you scratch the monolayer and you actually wound the cells. And then the question is, did the cells start to migrate because they're wounded? Or did the cells start to migrate because there's free space into which they can crawl? Now, we don't really know if we're wounding the cells at the boundary. There's others who've shown that just creation of free space is sufficient to start crawling. Whether there's wounding here, in this one, it's, it's, it's a little hard for us to say. I, I guess you could figure that out if you knew more about injury than I do. But that's, uh, that's a really good question. But the way I think about this is that actually the cells are, if you will, they're jammed. They're, they're, they're so packed, cheek by jowl, that they can barely move up here. So, so they're just, the cell density is high. And when you create free space, there's a wave of unjamming, just like in a traffic jam. The light, if the light turns green, now there's free space, and there's actually a legitimate wave, I mean a wave with a defined speed that starts here and moves back. If you look at the movies, the movies are online, you can actually see the wave propagate backwards and as, as one cell moves forward it makes space for the next one and that propagates all the way across the monolayer. So is, is it a wave of unjamming? I, I, don't, I don't know for sure but that's what it looks like to me. Yes? There are many forces involved in all this. If we balance these forces and stop the cell from movement, then and when we just remove that force, will they start again to move with the same force or not? If, if so, if you stop them, yeah, stop them and then remove the that extra. Uh, haven't haven't done that experiment. Although Jay Kim is doing an experiment close to that, where he's he's put a barrier in the way. So he has a he's put a. Uh, a micro patent region where the cells can't crawl on, so they, they collide with the barrier. And we're looking at what happens there, and he's got all the data. And after how, uh, how much time they just lost this one? Like, how much if time? The, if we put the barrier for a long time, that maybe they. Oh, if you put the barrier, pr yeah, probably they're going to stop, and maybe you'll go back to a state kind of like this. <coughs> but we, uh, we haven't done that experiment yet, so that, that would actually be fun to do. Do you get another wave? I, that's really interesting, because what, what this is, I, I don't want to get too techy on you, but if there's waves, it says there's something that's hyperbolic, about, it's a hyper hyperbolic system, so if you put a barrier here, you might see shock waves or, or something going on, and we haven't actually looked for that yet, but I've been thinking about that, that maybe, I mean, that, that from, mechanically, this is a really rich system, and we're just scratching the surface, I think. So there's lots of interesting things to do. And actually, 
I've got a new fellow who just joined my lab, someone from Iran, actually, who had studied colliding plasma streams. And so she's setting up an experiment to have actually two model layers actually run into each other. So it would be similar to what, what you're talking about. Yeah? Can you extend this approach to a three-dimensional? I wish. <laughs> It's, it's, you know, it's just, that, that, that's, that's a, big, a big and important question. This, this measurement technique only works in 2D. And so the question is, how much can we learn and how much will carry over to 3D? And the answer might be nothing or a lot. And you know, that, I wish I knew. There are lots of people studying how cells invade in, in, in 3D. And a lot of things are different, for sure. So uh, don't know. On the other hand, two-dimensional systems, you know, epithelium and endothelium are innately kind of two-dimensional, so that kind of begs the question. So it's, they're not irrelevant biologically, but again, this is, this is a very reduced system. It's the cells on collagen-coated gels, and just it is what it is, and uh, if we can learn. But the notion of plethotaxis, you know, cells, you know, wanting to minimize intercellular shear stress, that, that may carry over into 3D. Or, or it may not, and, it, and that's probably testable somehow. What about abnormal systems like, you know, maybe setting up a monolayer of cancer cells that may have different cell cell interactions? We've done that. Yeah, that's that, that appeared last year. So we looked at, I can't remember some uh, uh, breast cancer cell lines that that have disrupted junctions, and it turns out plethotaxis goes away. You, you, the cells lose their steerage. So that's uh, we've done a little bit of that. Also, if you chelate the calcium. The cathedrons go away, and again, this plethotaxis gets ablated. So we've we've got there is some data on that. Yeah. So uh, you said that the, um, the polyfilmagel floor that you were using is about one kilopascal. Have you tried yeah. looking at um, lower or higher stiffnesses and seeing how that? Yeah, that, that's you know that yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, we did um, in the paper that appeared last year. We look actually a reviewer call for that. So we did uh, experiments on widely different substrate stiffnesses and we found no difference. Now others looking at single cell systems and some multi -cell have, have found uh, big differences. And when we look at single cells we find big differences. We published actually a theoretical, well not a theoretical, a theoretical and experimental paper I think a couple of years ago that if the gel is thin enough and, and the monolayer is big enough, the cell looks virtually, the, the substrate looks virtually rigid. It depends on the width to depth ratio. And it could be these are wide enough that basically if you pull on the gel, you're feeling, you're feeling the rigid substrate, right? Whereas if you're one cell on a, on a, on a thick gel, <coughs> you're feeling the gel, not the substrate. So anyway, we, we've got a paper on that that we make the argument that it's, it's the width to depth ratio and, and these are effectively rigid, but those were not, it was not extensive studies. It was just, we did just enough to satisfy the reviewers, so I would say, call that an open question. Okay. There's, there's a paper by uh, Mike Morrell uh, with Paul Matsudera on looking at epithelial cell collective migration on mm -hmm. substrates of, of varying viscoelasticity. So it's... Oh, right, it right, right. That has yep. a different texture. Mm -hmm. of, yep. and, and there, what, one of the interesting things that he finds is that the, you know, he sees these sort of swirling patterns and mm -hmm. distances over which the motions correlate, and that changes abruptly as a function of stiffness mm -hmm. of the substrate. Mm -hmm. so, Right. There's some interesting behavior. An interesting behavior there. And then there's a recent paper that just appeared saying that PDMS and polyacrylamide are different. I don't know if you saw that. It's in Nature Materials. I can't remember who the first author was, but saying that if you match the material properties, same coating, but polyacrylamide versus PDMS, you get totally different behavior. It may be viscoelastic as opposed to elastic. Behavior. It could be that. I think they argued something about molecules being actually uh, being mobile in polyacrylamide and not in PDMS. But anyway, so there's a lot of, the substrate is hugely important. I think everyone agrees on that. Yeah. Um, so have you tried doing similar experiments, but perhaps using a thermal and, and viewing, see if no. any kind of wave? No, we haven't. We haven't. Okay. Uh, you know, but that, you know, it's going to be important to do, but it's, that, that's, that's not at the top of our list, but I mean, for, for people interested in those sorts of things, yeah, it'll be really important and, and easy.
to do. Yeah, I'd be interested in seeing yeah. um, what the mass behavior would be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, they they will. I mean, if it's yeah, key, but, but then what are the, what are the force implications, the stress implications of that? Yeah, that was a, a really good question. So, is the collective behavior uh, between the cell cell adherent junctions and the cytoskeletal uh, components, or uh, mainly dominated by cell cell adherent junctions? Oh, which kinds of junctions? No, the collective behavior. Yeah. Uh, is the <coughs> by the cell cell adherent junctions, or is the combination of cell cell adherent junctions and the cytoskeletal? Oh, yeah, it's, it's got to be both. We, we, we know if you take away the adherence junctions, the behavior totally changes. So but but it's but but that there's then those are connected to the cytoskeleton, so. So it's got it's got to be both. What if what if you do cytoclase and D3? Uh, I don't don't we didn't do that. We did do blebistatin to turn off the myosin motors, and this was an interesting thing in terms of those those X waves I talked about. When you when you take away th this is actually we don't understand this. So we use we are we thought that you know myosin has to be playing a big role in how the cells are are spreading. So you use blebistatin, and when you do, the traction forces get knocked way, way down by more than an order of magnitude. The, the spreading velocity of the monolayer doesn't change, believe it or not. It doesn't change at all. So the myosin motor activity is reduced, but maybe the load against which it's pulling is also reduced. So the velocity of spreading is unchanged. That uh, actually, other people had found that. So we, at first, we thought it was crazy, but we found that others had found that. Interestingly, that that wave that I talked about persists. You can still find it, but it doesn't move. It's stationary. <laughs> you can find it, it. Just it just sits there. It's like it's like a waterfall that, that doesn't. You know, it just stands in front of you. So uh, it, it's anyway. It's in the paper. You can read about it. It's it's. We don't really understand that, but. And also, oh, the other thing is, if you take away calcium, the, um, the, the, it stops crawling. If you put the calcium back, it starts crawling again, and it, it launches another wave, which actually gets to someone's question over here about, is it an injury? So it, the answer is probably it isn't, because when we just put calcium back, you, you generate another one of these rearward propagating waves. So that wasn't injury, just bringing the calcium back. So it's, you know, I don't know what's going on, but anyway, the, the measurements are now straightforward. So we, you know, all these are answerable questions. Anybody else? I have a question on the single cell so Yeah. The polarization happens in the tension only or in compression. Well. Good. Yeah. Uh, I was quite convinced that it would have to be both because I was thinking about this in terms of molecules trapped in energy wells, and if you, <coughs> if you, if you perturb them, you would then break the bond. What we actually, we did the experiment. It turns out it happens in stretch. So stretch, return, you fluidize. If you compress and return, nothing. Compression does nothing, at least in the cells we look at. So that cell rheology is mostly compression, and that's why you see this uh, self-stiffening. I'm sorry, I didn't. Cell uh, rheology, G prime developed. Yeah. That's why it's consistent. Uh, you see stiffening there. Yeah. But some yeah. It, it must be that when you stretch, you, you have bonds that are under tension, and you can just basically break them. Or there could be severing proteins that are force-dependent, and maybe you can expose regions that are more susceptible. With compression, we, d we don't find it. Zero. Well, with compression this way, you'd get extension this way. You would. But I guess if you've got all the stress fibers in this orientation... They're all kind of... They're not totally in the plane, but they, they tend to be close. So, yeah. Anyway, that's what we find. And actually, I think, I, I think we published that somewhere. Is there any threshold force? No, it doesn't, doesn't seem to be. It seems to be like the, 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 more, you, uh, the more you stretch, the more fluidization you get. And in the cells we study, you can knock the, with a 10% with a stretch, you basically can knock the tension down to about zero. And with smaller stretches, we haven't really looked, we haven't really looked hard for thresholds. So, but at least in the range we've looked, it just seems to be the, the more stretch, the more fluidization. But I, I don't really know.
Yeah. Um, the experiments you have performed is more or less like expansion of the cell sheet into empty spaces. Yeah. But for example, during the development of the embryo, you don't really get a free space. Right. So, right. Um, how do you think, for example, cryptotaxis it will change in this case? Because like for videos from Ray, I saw some like sharing of the cells, yeah. movement, like lateral movement of the cells. Yeah. So um, in that case, is like what what you're saying? Is it violated or is uh, totally yeah? Different? Well, I I wish I knew. I mean, every time I think about development or. Here, here talks like that. This one was actually su superb. I get a headache because I, I can't, un you know, it's so much more complicated than these systems. It, you know, if we, I wish we knew the answer. So this is a very reduced system as compared to a, like a, 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 a fly gastrulation. So some of these things probably come into play, but it's, it's a different, it's a different system, and I, I just wish I knew, but we're not there yet. On the other hand, uh, you know, there's a guy, uh, Schwartz, uh, Martin Schwartz, who's now at Yale. He now has probes that can actually measure forces at cell-cell junctions. And maybe doing that in the fly, one could take these, you know, get maps like these, but in a more, a more biological system. Maybe, maybe that's coming. Jeff, maybe that's a good place to stop. Oh, okay. uh, You're welcome to join us for lunch for further questions. If you okay, can. yeah, I can hang around for a little while. And uh, which is just over here, but uh, thanks again. Great.